let's talk about numbers. So computers are doing just about everything in the world now. They mediate or cause or, or benefit virtually everything we do now. But if you look at what a computer is, a computer is a machine that manipulates numbers, and that's all that they can do. So the fact that they do so much just by manipulating numbers seems almost magical. So let's look at where numbers came from and where they might be going and, and how they work. So we'll start with fingers. Now it turns out fingers are much older than numbers. We evolved fingers to help us move around in trees and to pick fruit and eat fruit. And we were really happy doing that for millions of years until the climate changed, the trees started to disappear, we had to go down onto the ground and walk in the grass and, and look for other sources of food. Um, and so it turned out the other thing that hands, that fingers were useful for was manipulating tools. For example, a stick that you would use to dig in the earth to, to find tubers and rocks to pound the tubers to make them soft enough to eat because our cute little monkey teeth really can't eat very many things. And so we had to learn how to cook in order to survive. And as we got more proficient with tools, that affected our evolution, and so we kept getting upgrades. And soon we learned how to make knives out of volcanic glass and, and learned how to manage fire and eventually how to put seeds into the ground and, and grow our own food. And as a result of that, we started to grow into larger and larger communities. That we moved from families and clans into cities and nations. And as we grew, we had the problem of keeping track of all of the human activity. And it could get very, very complicated. And so in order to manage that, we had to invent accounting. So we had lots of ways of, well, it turns out our brains are really not very good at remembering a lot of numbers. And the more complicated our societies got, the more numbers we had to keep track of. And so we could make um, notches on sticks and marks on walls. We could put knots into strings, but we would forget what those represented. And so in order to manage that, we had to invent writing. Now we use writing for, for lots of things, for letters, for laws, for literature, but first it was ledgers. So writing, I think, is the most important invention in, that we've ever accomplished. And it happened three distinct times. Uh, the first time was in the Fertile Crescent, uh, some people, the smart money thinks it happened in Mesopotamia. I think it happened in Egypt. Uh, it also was discovered in China and also independently discovered in America. Unfortunately, that civilization didn't survive the Spanish invasion. So let's look at some number systems from history. So this is the way that they made numbers in Egypt. They had, it's obviously a base 10 system they had a character that represented each power of 10. A stick was one, a piece of rope was 100, a finger was 10,000, and a guy going like, it's a lot, it means a million. So that demonstrates some real mathematical sophistication. They had a symbol for exactly an, a million. It didn't mean a whole lot, it meant a million things exactly, no more, no less. So. And, and they could also, they had lots of other things that they figured out, that a th three by four by five rec uh, triangle made a, a, a right angle, and they knew what the right angle was for. They had a system for dealing with um, fractions, a really clever thing by adding reciprocals, and they uh, had an approximation for pi. They had quite a lot of stuff going on. They. Um, taught their system to the Phoenicians who were working out of what we now call Lebanon. They were very uh, uh, good navigators and traders. They sailed all over the, the Mediterranean and part of the Atlantic. And they took the Egyptian system, which was quite complicated, and simplified it so that writing was just the consonants. And so they 
reduced the character set from the thousands that the Egyptians were using down to a couple dozen, where it was much easier to use. And they taught their system to people that they traded with, including the Greeks. The Greeks took the Phoenician system, improved it by adding vowels, so they could now more correctly record all of the words. And at one time, the Greek alphabet contained 27 letters. And so they used the same alphabet for recording numbers. So they took the first nine letters and assigned them one through nine, and the next got 10 through 90, and the next got 100 through 900. They taught their system to the Romans, but the Romans were still basically using the Egyptian system, but they took the Greek idea of using letters instead of using the hieroglyphics. And they added an innovation to make the numbers a little bit more compact. One problem with the Egyptian system is that if you're talking about 99, you got a thing that was 18 characters long. So the Romans wanted to shorten that. So they came up with a a character that represented half of a 10 or half of a uh, 100 or a 1,000. So uh, the one or the I represented a stick and the X represented a bundle of sticks tied together and the V was just the X cut in half. The other innovation was they added subtraction to the number system. So the, other, the first systems I showed you were additive, where the value of a number is just the sum of all of the characters. But the Romans had an idea where if, the, if a character is smaller than the next character, then instead of adding it to the total, it subtracts it. it meanwhile, in China, they're doing a really interesting thing. So they have a, another system where they have characters for one through nine, and then they have a set of multipliers and modifiers. So you can compose numbers of any size or any complexity just by composing them together. Very, very elegant system. But the big thing happened in India. Mathematicians in India came up with the idea of zero, a number that represented nothing, and using it in, on a positional basis. So the number set is very small, it's only 10 characters, but they can be combined to create any number. And this was a, a really important idea. The Indians taught their system to the Persians. They called them um, Hindu numbers. And the Persians taught them to the Arabs, and the Arabs taught them to the Europeans, who called them Arabic numbers. And that's basically the number system that most of the world is using today. And the really remarkable thing about it is, no matter what language you speak, you can understand these numbers. So they're about as universal as human communication can get. So this is the same number written in all of these systems. And all of these systems worked. And they maintained important nations and empires for centuries. Um, so it's hard to argue that one of these systems is better than another. The one advantage that the Indian system had over everybody else was that you could take a column of numbers and add them together without using an abacus. Just using a pen and paper and with a little bit of training with your brain, you could sum a whole lot of numbers. And that was something that was not easily done in any of the other systems. That's not important anymore today because we have computers. So why are we still using this number system? There's no clear advantage. Well, except maybe there's some UI advantages. Like I can't imagine typing a phone number using Roman numerals. It just seems really, really hard. But then I don't remember the last time I typed in a phone number, so maybe that doesn't matter much anymore either. So the, the important idea that we got from the Indian numbers was they taught us more about mathematics. So it's a positional system, so you can take the number line and stretch it out and take your digits and put them on the number line, and at each position, you multiply the digit times 10 to the power of that position. And so it turns out that, that the Indian numbers are a shorthand for polynomials. And polynomials turn out to be a really important concept in mathematics, so that sort of falls out of the number notation. That was not something that was discovered in any of the other number systems. 
It also allowed for negative numbers. So we could annotate a number with a minus sign, and we can now represent negative things, which was a concept which was meaningless in the other numbers systems. You couldn't talk about negative two loaves of bread. It, that didn't make sense. But we can in this system. And it turns out that there are a lot of interesting things that happen as a result of having negative numbers. One of those things is we can take the number line and stretch it to infinity in the other direction as well. And we can start lining things up that way. So now we can get the real numbers. We, uh, all, everybody else had systems with, that could deal with fractions, but they were special cases. With the Indian system, we get fractions in exactly the same way. You just need a little discipline to manage the decimal places. So in the original Indian notation, you indicated the, the ones position by putting an overline above it. But over the years, that changed to some mark separating the, the ones column from the tenth column. And in different countries, there are different conventions for how you write that. In some countries, a decimal point is, or a period is used. In some countries, a comma is used. And for a long time, it didn't matter. You could be in your country, and you could be writing your numbers your own way, and that was fine. But it becomes a problem when you have the internet, because now numbers are going everywhere. And no matter where you are, you're going to see these numbers, and everybody's going to see things that are different. And confusion can occur. For example, depending on where you are and how you were trained, you may read this number as 2,048, or you may read it as 2 and 48 thousandths. And that could turn out to be a really serious error. You know, if you're talking about how much money someone is owed, this could, could be a problem. So I predict eventually the world will figure out a way to pick one of these, because there's no value in having this confusion. But the difficulty in picking one is that neither is obviously better than the other. The period is not obviously better than the comma. The comma is not better, obviously, than the period. So how will the world choose? I predict that you will decide this. And what you'll decide is the, is the period, because that is what your programming languages use. And ultimately, all of the numbers in the world are going through your programs. And you're going to decide eventually, everybody, let's, let's just get this done. So all of the systems that we just looked at are base 10. Um, so you know, they were doing numbers in the Middle East, and they were doing numbers in China. No communication between them, but they both came out with base 10. So how did that happen? Well, that's how many fingers they had in both places. They just counted their fingers, and that's how they made their arithmetic, and it worked. But there are other cultures that did it differently. For example, in America, they were doing stuff that was base 20. You go, well, how did they get to 20? I think it's pretty obvious. They counted their fingers, and they counted their toes. And it worked. They, they had a, a significant civilization. It worked. They were doing mathematics, but they were doing it in base 20. There were some cultures that did stuff in base 12, and we can still see bits of base 12 in, in our world. For example, our clocks are, have base 12 in them. Um, in, in my culture, we still have 12 to a dozen. We've got uh, 12 inches to a foot, just really aggravating stuff that we learned from the British, and we can't get rid of it. Um, and then uh, in Sumer, they were doing stuff base 60. Go, oh, base 60? How, how did they get to that? So we're still stuck with base 60, right? We've got it in our timekeeping. We've got it in our uh, geographic measurement. If you've ever done geographic apps and you have to manage the coordinate system using base 60, it's really hard. It adds a lot of unnecessary complexity. So how did they get to base 60? I think what happened was, well, so as the city-states were starting to grow, they grew by accumulating lots of smaller settlements and merging them all into big ones. And they tried to merge a community that was doing base 10 with a community that was doing base 12. And there was somebody, some king or committee, somebody had to decide, how are we going to unify these? 
And the correct answer should have been, we're gonna go with base 10. And the second best answer would have been, let's go with base 12. But instead they picked the worst answer, which was, let's go with the least common multiple. And the reason we're gonna do that is because as a committee, we can't decide which one is better, and so we'll go with a mutually disagreeable compromise. The thing which is kind of compatible with what everybody wants, but is not the thing that anybody wants. And it turns out committees are still doing that all of the time. That's how standards get made. So the really interesting thing that happens is binary is discovered. That we can take the Indian system and simply replace the tens with twos, and we can represent everything with bits. And this is a really important step forward because this allows computers to be invented. So when we start representing computers in binary, if we want them to be signed numbers, we have to figure out how we're gonna deal with the sign. And there are three conventions for how we can do that. One of them is called signed magnitude, where we simply add an extra bit to the number and we decide if it's one way it's a positive number and if it's the other way it's a negative number. And it doesn't matter if we put that bit at the front or the back or if one is plus or if zero is plus. It's just a convention and all of the conventions work. Another way is one's complement where we add a sign bit and the way we represent a negative number is we simply flip every bit and then it becomes negative. The problem with that though is that an addition could cause a carry and if there's a carry, then you have to take the carry bit and add it back into the end. But otherwise it works. And the other problem with it is that there are two, or just like the sign magnitude, there are two versions of zero, positive zero and negative zero, which doesn't make sense because zero doesn't have a sign, so we've got an extra number in the system. Then there's two's complement, which gets around the end around carry problem in one's complement by doing the carry, or by anticipating the carry when you do the complement. So minus n is not n plus one. And then you don't have to do the end around carry. It's, uh, and we only get one zero, which is good, but we get an extra negative number, which is kind of a problem, because you cannot get the absolute value of that number. And if you try to negate that number, you get that same negative number back. So that's a potential source of bugs. So I think we should take that extra number, either the extra minus a zero or the extra negative number, and turn it into a signal, something which says, this is not a number. So that would allow us to avoid this problem that we have in Java. If we use the index of method to find a string in another string, and if it doesn't find it, Java has no way of signaling that because it's crappy type system can only return an int, and ints can only contain ints. And there's no way, to, so they came up with this wacky compromise, they'll pass minus one. But unfortunately, if you just take whatever the return value is and put it into another computation, you can get an in incorrect result. Whereas if it returned an, a, a null value, then that could be detected downstream and we're less likely to compute bad things. So let's look some more at the types in our languages. So we have lots of languages that have int32 um, by various names. So if we add two int32s together, what is the type of the result? Any guesses? Anybody? Int33. Int the answer is int33, because you can get a number that's a little bit bigger as a result of adding them together. Now, Java got this wrong. Java says it's int32. It's actually int33. So let's try another one. Multiply int32 by int32. What do you get? Close, it's int63. It's int63, but very close. But you're better than Java, I'll give you that. So what's going on here is overflow, where as a result of doing an ordinary computation, it's possible to get a result that doesn't fit. 
Now, our CPUs are aware of this. For example, on Intel architecture, if you do an add, there is a, a flag in the CPU called the carry flag, which contains that 33rd bit. And you need that bit. Uh, so the CPU provides it. And also on the Intel architecture, if you do that 32-bit multiply, you get a 64-bit result. There's a, a register that contains those 32 bits that you need. And there's also an overflow flag, which is set if ignoring the carry flag and the, the higher order part of the multiply, it'll tell you if that's going to cause a terrible error. And unfortunately, Java does not allow you to get at that information. And so it just throws it away, which is a problem. So what should happen if an overflow happens? What should happen if we compute something and it doesn't fit? There are a number of schools of thought here. One says we should store a null value, which I think is a very reasonable thing. Another thing says we should store the largest possible value. This is called saturation. And it could be a reasonable thing to do in signal processing and computer graphics, but you do not want to do this in financial applications. Then there should be a fault. You know, the machine should raise an exception, or you know, something should happen, and so some other software can decide this computation is messed up, we need to reset and fix things. Some say that the machine should halt, which is kind of drastic, but that's how they used to work. If the machine ever detected that something was wrong, it would just stop. But instead, if your intention is to maximize the creation of errors, what you want to do is discard the most significant bits without notification. In fact, that's exactly what Java does, and it's what most of our programming languages do. They are designed to maximize the creation of errors. So when the first von Neumann machines started coming online, they were integer-only machines, but the machines were built by mathematicians and programmed by mathematicians, and they wanted to work with the real numbers, but all they had were integers. And so they did scaled arithmetic, where any value would actually, its real value would be considered as that value times some scale factor. And if you had two numbers that had the same scale factor, you could simply add them together. But if they had different scale factors, then you would have to change at least one of them so that their scale factors matched before they could be added. And multiplication got a little bit more complicated because you had to divide out the redundant scale factor at the end. And division became more complicated because you had to factor in the scale factor before you do the division. And uh, people complain that this made programming really difficult, very, very error prone. And it was also difficult to find the optimal scale factor for any application in any case. So somebody came up with this idea of doing floating point, where they would have approximately real numbers represented as two numbers, one of them being the number itself and the other being where the decimal point is within that number. And then you could have subroutines, which would do the adding and multiplication, and you get the best possible results that the machine can deliver with much less programming. And it was a big hit. So the first for form of floating point worked something like this. You'd have some number, and its value would be uh, 10 raised to the log of the scale factor. And this was... In implemented in software on the first von Neumann machines, and it worked. It was brilliant, but it was really, really slow. And the machines were already very, very slow. And doing all of this work in software made them even slower. So there was interest in trying to figure out how to get this into hardware. And in, in the next generations of machines, they figured that out. But they decided to do binary floating point instead of decimal floating point. The main difference was in decimal floating point, you sometimes have to divide by 10 in order to normalize numbers, and that's really expensive. Whereas in binary floating point, you just shift a bit, and that's virtually free. And so um, binary floating point took off. And, and this is what the binary floating point standards look like. They, they all look pretty much like this. 
you've got a sign bit, which is actually the sign of the significand that's kind of pulled apart, and it's all sign of magnitude. And the, bi or the exponent is biased, meaning that if the exponent is positive, it'll have a one bit. And if it's a negative exponent, it'll have a zero bit. And the reason for all this magic is that you can do an integer comparison of two floating point values to see which is greater than the other, and it will work. And so that was a, a clever little bit of, of optimization. But there's a problem, and that is that 0.1 plus 0.2 is not 0.3. It's, it's close, but it's, it's not right. And this is a problem. Uh, has anyone ever encountered this? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, everybody's hands went up. It's weird, nasty stuff. So let's look at what's going on. Okay, so we, we're, we're on our number line now, our positional system with bits now. And so 0.1 is approximately a 16th plus a 32nd, but it's a little, little bit bigger than that, so we'll need some more bits. And it turns out it's an infinitely repeating series, similar to how one-third in a decimal, decimal fraction goes forever, you get threes forever. In the binary system, going one-tenth, you get zero, zero, one, one, repeated forever. And that's fine if you have an infinite number of bits. If you go follow it all the way down to infinity, you'll get exactly the right thing, except we don't have an infinite number of bits. At some point, we have to truncate. And depending on where you truncate, that's going to determine what kind of error you're going to get. If you truncate just before a zero, then you're going to lose all of the one bits that follow. And so your result is going to be a little bit too small. And if you truncate in front of a one bit, then we're going to have a carry and the number that we get is going to be just a tiny bit too large. And you could hope that over time, over the course of your computation, you'll have some numbers that are too small and some numbers that are too big, and it'll all balance out. No, that doesn't happen. And what happens is the error accumulates and accumulates, and so the more computation we do, the worse it gets. Um, so. Uh, whenever we represent a constant in a programming language or, or in data as a, a decimal fraction with a point in it, then we are not getting exactly that number. We're getting an approximation of that number because we're working with a number system that cannot exactly represent the decimal fractions. Every number containing a decimal point is slightly wrong. And that breaks the associative law. The associative law is really important in thinking about the algebraic manipulation of, of programs and expressions, but it fails if the inputs, outputs, and intermediate results of the computation cannot all be represented exactly. And because none of our numbers are represented exactly, everything's wrong, and it means that a plus B plus C is not the same thing as A plus B plus C, that the order in which you do the calculations can change the result. So all of our computation is suspect. So this is not new. They knew this when they de developed binary floating point, and they understood the trade-off. And at that time, there were two schools of computation. If you had a computer, you were either doing scientific stuff and you'd be writing in Fortran using a binary floating point, or you'd be doing business stuff, writing in COBOL using a system called BCD. BCD is binary coded decimal, where they allocated four bits for each digit, and you know, just a, an ordinary counting of it, and then you do your arithmetic using that. And so it was two worlds, and at that time that was all the computation as computers became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, um, uh, computers end up doing more and more and more things. Um, but that's sort of where we started, and we're still kind of stuck in that pattern. So another problem with binary floating point is it's difficult to do the text conversion. 
taking a piece of text and turning it into a number, and taking a number and turning it back into a piece of text. That needs to be done correctly. It, it, you want it to be optimal, using as few digits as possible, and you want the results to be unsurprising. And this turns out to be a really difficult problem. It's also computationally expensive. So, um, on most modern, in most modern programming languages, we have a confusion of faulty number types. For example, if you're writing in Java, every time you create a variable or a property or a parameter, you have to choose byte char short int long float or double, which one? You have to pick the right one. And if you pick the right one, then your program's gonna work. And if you pick the wrong one, your program may fail. But it's not gonna fail immediately, and it will not fail in its tests. It's gonna fail sometime in the future when the thing overflows and, and bad stuff happens. So, what could happen if something overflows? Well, one of the most spectacular examples was the Ariane 5 failure. You remember this was a rocket that was sent up by the European Space Agency, and it went wildly off course and, and blew up a few seconds after takeoff, and it was due to a software bug in its um, guidance software. It was, the bug was written in ADA. I translated the bug into Java. Basically, they had a, a, a double variable called horizontal bias, and they converted it into a short, and it overflowed. So the value that went into that short was wildly wrong, and it went into the guidance system and totally confused the guidance system, and it could not recover. The cost of this failure is estimated to be about half a billion dollars. Now, I'm guessing you haven't made a bug yet that's worth half a billion dollars, but you could. I mean, it, it's still possible. So we should, and you don't want it to be you, right? So we should be trying to figure out programming conventions and systems which allow us to avoid these sorts of problems. So JavaScript does much better here. JavaScript only has one number type, and that means there's a large class of errors which are automatically avoided because you cannot create a bug by choosing the wrong number type, which is brilliant. The only problem is it's the wrong type. <laughs> Some applause there, yeah. <laughs> and the reason it's the wrong type is because it's a binary floating point, and we really need decimal floating point, because we're doing things like adding money, and, and we want results that make sense. So I propose to fix this, and my fix is called DEC64. It's a modern decimal floating point. I recommend that DEC64 be the only number type in well-designed application programming languages in the future, because if there's only one number type, you cannot make an error by choosing the wrong type. And I think that provides much more value than we could ever get by having multiple types. In a hardware implementation, DEC64 integers can be added in a single cycle, which eliminates the performance argument, which has sustained ints up until this point. Nice thing about DEC64 is that numbers work the way humans think numbers work. So the way you learned in school to add and multiply, DEC64 works the same way. It's just a lot, lot faster and more careful than you are. So elimination of numeric confusion reduces errors. Also, it turns out that conversion of DEC64 numbers to text and back is simple, efficient, correct, and unsurprising. In fact, it's only slightly more complicated than converting integers to text and back. You just have to manage where the decimal point goes, and you can remove excess zeros from both ends, not just one end. DEC64 can exactly represent decimal fractions up to 16 digits, which is enough for most of our applications. It can represent numbers as minuscule as 1 to 10 to the minus 127th, which is pretty small, and up to 3 with 143 digits after it, which is pretty big. So this is what it looks like. It's also really simple. It's 
In fact, it's very similar to the original floating point numbers that were developed on the EDSAC back in the 40s. So a number is represented as two numbers, which are both packed into a 64-bit word. There is a coefficient, which is 56 bits, and there's an exponent, which is 8 bits, and the value of a number is simply the coefficient times 10 raised to the exponent. That's literally the whole format, so it's very, very simple. The reason the exponent is at the bottom is because on Intel architecture, we can unpack that for free. And so that helps in a software implementation. In fact, if you want to look at the software implementation, it's on GitHub. And if you're thinking about designing the next programming language, I very strongly encourage you to consider putting DEX64 into your language as the only number type. So let's talk a little bit more about numbers. So what is zero divided by zero? Any guesses? Yeah, um, there's some confusion, but uh, let's look at some of the cases. So most mathematicians will say it's undefined. And by that, they don't mean the silly thing that JavaScript means by undefined. They mean it's undefined. It doesn't make sense. You can't even talk about it. You can't even think about it. It's not meaningful. Shut up. Don't, don't say that. It's just... Stop it. And, and that's fine for, for mathematics, because that's all happening in a, in a theoretical space, but it doesn't work for computation, because if someone can put those inputs into a machine, the machine has to do something. So you, you can't tell the machine designer that it's undefined and they don't have to implement it. Something has to happen. So one theory is that the machine should catch fire. And it's okay because no one should ever try to divide zero by zero because it's undefined. So it's okay that the machine catches fire, so it should never happen. But we know that's not true, right? Because if, if we can cause something to happen, it will happen even if we know it shouldn't. So another argument is it should be null or some kind of sentinel value which says this is not a value. And that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, there's one school that says it should be zero, that zero divided by zero should be zero because anything divided by, or zero divided by anything should be zero. There's some mathematicians who aren't sure about this, but for most business applications, this is the thing that makes sense. If we sold zero units last month and the uh, total profit on those units was zero, what was the average profit per item? It'd be zero, right? If you'd said anything else, people would go, you know, you're going to jail. You can't do that. Some people say it should be one, right? Because n over n is one. I once worked on a mainframe where it was two. This was a machine that was designed by Seymour Cray, the greatest computer designer in history. And I put in zero, divided by zero, and I got out two. And I can imagine a conversation that happened at Control Data Corporation. Someone said, Seymour, there is a problem with your divide circuit. I said, what's the problem? I said, well, if someone divides zero by zero, they get two. And he said, look, it shouldn't happen. No reasonable person should ever do that. And if I put in extra logic for that case, I'm going to, um, divide is already the slowest thing that the machine does. So if I put another check around it, it's going to slow division down for everybody, including all the smart people who are using it correctly, and it's going to make the machine more expensive. I'm not going to do it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to slow down the machine and make it more expensive just because some idiot wants to divide zero by zero. And as far as I know, I'm the only person who ever tried it. So there you go. So why do I care about that? I'm actually more concerned with this case. What is zero times n for any value of n, for all values of n? What, what's the answer? I think you're right. I think it is zero. And in fact, there were compiler writers who, if they determined that you had an expression that was a multiply and they could determine at compile time, if one of the operands was zero and if the other operand had no side effects, We'll just put, we'll emit a constant. We don't have to do the multiply at all. 
And so not only does the compiler go faster, the code goes faster. So that was a big win. Unfortunately, when the IEEE floating point standard was created, they said, no, those compilers are in error because if n is nan, then the result of zero times nan is nan, not zero. So even if we know that one of the operands is zero, we have to evaluate the other one. Just in the case it might be nan, so we can produce a nan result. And I think that was wrong. I think that was a mistake. Because math in mathematics, anything times zero is going to be zero. So why, why should we care? Who writes code like this? Well, not a lot of humans write code like this, but machines do. So code generators, macro processors, partial evaluators, they will write code which will multiply something by zero. Also, there are non-conditional idioms. Modern CPUs have really long um, uh, instruction decode pipelines, which take many, many, many cycles but they can process a whole lot of stuff very quickly as long as there are no conditional jumps. If there's a conditional jump, then everything stalls until they can figure out which way the branch is going to go, and it really slows things down. And so there's a way of creating code where if you have to choose between two values, instead of saying if some condition choose A, otherwise B, you would turn that condition into uh, a dummy. It's, going to be either 0 or 1, and then you subtract it from 1 to get the other thing, and then you multiply those and then add them together. Even though that seems like a lot of work, it can actually be faster than doing the thing with the jumps. So I want it to be fast for that case, too. So I recommend that 0 divided by n, 0 times n, n times 0, and 0 modulo n, they should all produce 0. And in fact, with DEC64, that's what you get. So I propose that for the next generation of, of application languages, that's how we should do it. So I'm just about at the end, but before I close, I, I have some thank yous I need to give. Uh, there are some people I really want to thank. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today because they're dead, but I want to thank them anyway. Uh, so I want to start with Leonardo Fibonacci of Pisa. In the late 12th century, Leonardo visited Arabia and learned the amazing thing that the Arabian mathematicians were doing. Learned their number system, their algebra, their geometry, their algor algorithms. He took it back to Europe, wrote a book that he published in 1202, which over the next century or two transformed Europe. Uh, he came up with things which created new forms of banking and those new forms of banking created a huge increase in the supply of capital, which fueled the Renaissance. I want to thank uh, Gottfried uh, Leibniz, first for the calculus, that was great stuff, but also for binary. He was the first guy to figure out you could put base two in the, into the Indian positional number system, and he thought that it was wonderful, and, and he was right. Uh, I want to thank George Boole. George Boole was an English logician. He developed a system of, of algebra based on just two values, true and false. So that the Boolean type is named after Boole. I want to thank Claude Shannon, an American uh, researcher. He did two amazing things. The first was he found a correspondence between electronics and Boolean algebra so that you could convert Boolean algebra into circuits. And in fact, that's how computers are, are made, or how they're designed, which is brilliant stuff. And then he goes and invents a, a theory of information which says that any analog signal can be turned into a digital signal and back to any desired degree of precision, which enables the internet and all digital media, all, all videos, all audio, all of that stuff falls out of Shannon's work, which is amazing stuff. So I want to thank him for that. And finally, I want to thank Tahuti. I, I couldn't find a photograph. Uh, so, so I've got this relief that was carved in stone. 
It's the best picture I could find of him. Tahuti invented writing. He was the guy in Egypt who figured out the Rebus principle, that you could take a picture of something and take the sound of that picture and use the sounds, compose the sounds, in order to write things that could not be represented with pictures. And that is what started writing. So he was an accountant, he was an inventor, he was a teacher, and he taught his system of writing and created the profession of scribes. So in religious tradition, it sometimes said, it is written. So who wrote what was written? And it turns out in Egypt, it was scribes. And when the scribes wrote the mythology of Egypt, they put Tahuti into the story. They elevated him to the position of the god of writing and magic. And he becomes a, a, a very important figure in, in all of the stories. So why did they do that? I think they did it for two reasons. One was they wanted to elevate their profession. They wanted to show how important the position of scribe was, so they made the head scribe a god and had all of the other gods um, come to him uh, for, the, for the good things that he can do. And magic too, because magic is great. And the other reason they did it was they wanted to thank him. They wanted to thank him for giving them the best jobs in Egypt. That, you know, if they weren't doing that, they'd be out farming or, or hauling rocks or, or other hard work. Instead, they got to write and, and count and do magic. So that's great stuff. So uh, that's my story. So I want to thank all of you, and I'd like to tell you that you are the children of Tahuti. You are his sons and daughters. You use language to turn numbers into magic. Thank you. So, если какие-то вопросы, поднимайте руку, к вам тут же подбежит человек с микрофоном. И громко, четко на русском языке задавайте вопрос. А можно по-английски? А не, он так вас не понимает. Да шучу я, давай. Hello, Douglas. Thank you for your talk. Uh, is this format uh, deck 40? 64 is somehow proposed to the web committee uh, that it will be implemented in next JavaScript standard, for example. I, I don't think there's any hope of getting it at the JavaScript standard because it is a breaking change. And given the way the web works, the way JavaScript standards work, I don't think it's possible. I don't think the committee could consider something like this. So how I, I can use it uh, in JavaScript, for example? Yeah, so it's not going to help for JavaScript. I, it's going to help in the next language. I'm very much hopeful that there's going to be a next language, because if it turns out JavaScript is the last language, that would be really sad. So. <laughs> Неплохое начало, по-моему, да, конференции? Yeah, if, if the, think of the children, right? We can't leave JavaScript to your kids. We, we've got to give them something better. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the very inspiring and, uh, talk and the really unusual perspective on the numbers. But I have a question about your T-shirt, if yeah. you don't mind. You have four... And, uh, 1,000 if I don't confuse it, right? What does it, what does it mean? It means 40,000. Oh, okay. Uh, but is it some special number or...? Well, they're all, num all numbers are special. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Еще вопросы? Поднимайте руку, если хотите, чтобы вы задали вопрос. Здесь. Можно по-русски? Спасибо за ваш доклад. Я услышала от вас такую идею, что значит, число n, разделенное на 0, теперь не будет исключением, а будет нулем. Но правильно я поняла ваш доклад? Соответственно, у меня вопрос. Мы все знаем из высшей математики, что у нас, если есть некоторое число x, которое стремится к нулю, то, соответственно, результатом будет не 0, 
а число, стремящееся к бесконечности. Следовательно, получается, что если мы в программе ну, применим округление чисел, то вместо какого-то очень большого числа мы получим ноль. Вот хотелось бы прояснить этот вопрос. I'll try to <laughs> translate this. Yeah, don't uh, leave anything out. You have shown a slide where you divided the n by, by zero, mm -hmm. and if... Uh, no, no, I divided zero by n. You divided zero by n. Uh, so for, uh, am I right that now it's going to be not a none, but something else? <laughs> Ah, what, what would happen if we divide uh, n by zero, if n is not zero, probably? Oh, so n divided by zero is a, a different thing. So if n is not zero and you divide n by zero, then that should be an error, it should be a null, it's, it should, you know, some exceptional thing. That, that cannot have a value. It would it, be wrong for that to be zero. Index 64? In, in any system. In any yeah. system. Yeah. And there was also a second part of equation with some limits and some rows. I, I believe you better talk in the discussions on about that. Если есть еще какие-то вопросы? Справа. Uh, thank you for visiting us. And you predicted popularity of JavaScript. And what is your next prediction? So. I'm still looking for the next language. Um, Maybe it's closure? Uh, no, it's not closure. <laughs> it, it could have been. Um, the, the thing that the next language should do is it should help us to avoid the error patterns that we've gotten so used to. And it should help us more easily write distributed programs, programs that are going to be running in lots of places. Most of our languages are just new syntax on top of Fortran, you know, taking a sequential set of steps until we get to the end, because that's the easiest thing for us to think about. But clearly, the future of computing, it's already happening, is everything is distributed. We've got lots of cores. We're out in the cloud. We don't want to have a computation running in just one machine anymore. It's got to be running in lots of places in cooperation with lots of other places. And our languages are not serving us well for doing that. So that's what I'm hoping to see in the next language. It might turn out to be actors or it might be some other form. I'm, at this point, I can't predict what the next language is going to be, but th that is the class of problems that it should solve. Uh, there are some logical systems which deal with distributed systems. Um, so we've been doing, uh, is, are, do you mean logic programming? Yeah, so we've been doing that you know, in, in the AI community for a long time. And there's some good stuff about that which is not mainstreamed yet. So possibly that might be it. I, I don't know. Еще вопросы? Смелее. Uh, if, if uh, for example, if we have everything's fine with the, with the numbers in the next generation language, what would the next problem you would solve? Uh, I mean, you personally solve, except numbers. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. <laughs> uh, let's imagine that we have successfully solved the problem with the numbers. Yeah. So what would be the next problem to be solved? Oh, it's distributed programming. Making the program work cooperatively, cooperatively on many machines at the same time, also securely. Security is a big unsolved problem as well, that we have so much stuff of such high value, and, and now we have governments that are almost ready to go to war with each other based on what's happening in the computer networks. We've got to fix that. We've we got to make everything much more reliable so that everybody can put their stuff in the net and, and not be afraid of what could happen to them. And I heard that you have some special pro uh, project about that, about security. 
Ja. Okay. Uh, I'm going back to the question about uh, dividing by zero. <laughs> uh, uh, back at the start of the uh, talk, you uh, said that the difference between zero and uh, minus zero does make sense. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, there's still some uh, uh, some logic in this uh, in mathematics because uh, there are some uh, numbers in mathematics that как бы стремиться к нулю that are uh, quite close to zero, that are reaching the zero. Uh, and uh, if we uh, divide something, let's say that we divide uh, 10 by, uh, by one, then we get some number. If we uh, then lower this number, if we divide 10 by 0 0.1, then the result will be bigger. And uh, if we lower this number uh, quite enough that it will be close to zero, then in the end we'll get the infinity. So uh, 10 divided by zero should be the infinity in mathematics. Uh, do, you, do you get what I mean? Well, okay, so infinity in mathematics is not a value. <clears throat> it's a metaphor, mm -hmm. right? It, it, but computers don't understand metaphors. They only understand values. So when we talk about putting infinity into a computer set, it's never the metaphor, it's always the value, and then it doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean the same thing as the mathematical infinity. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you think, uh, is there any uh, hope that, uh, um, uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, in mathematics, uh, we can uh, not only, uh, not only we can uh, get uh, the infinity as the result, but we can also use this infinity as uh, the um, uh, arguments in some other uh, calculations. Uh, and uh, we can even, uh, uh, tell the difference between uh, plus infinity and minus infinity because if the, uh, the, uh, the number by which we divide uh, the first number is uh, reaching the zero but it's positive, ah, okay. Сложно, сложно, да, замудрил. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the answer, Douglas. Еще вопросы есть какие-то? Вот слева я видел, там рука была поднята. Она спряталась куда-то. Что, все? Гейм овер, заканчиваем. Даглас не, не уезжает, он еще у нас остается до тех пор, пока мы не вернем паспорт. И он будет доступен через буквально 5 минут в дискуссионной зоне. Вы к нему подходите, задавайте вопросы. Если они сложные, вы не смогли сейчас сформулировать, соберитесь с мыслями и в приватной обстановке с ним пообщайтесь. Даглас, thank you for your presentation. All the applause is for you. Oh, thank you.